I was going to start this talk with a cannabinopathic medicine with a brief uh, uh, history of uh, its ancient use. I mean, it's apparently been around for 10,000 years and has been used as a medicine over these thousands of years. The first physician to take an interest in cannabis as a medicine was W.B. O'Shaughnessy, a young professor at the Medical College of Calcutta, who had observed its use in India with patients suffering from rabies, rheumatism, epilepsy, and tetanus. In a recent report published in 1839, uh, I shouldn't say, in a report published in 1839, he wrote that he had found cannabis indica, which is a solution of cannabis and alcohol, taken orally, to be an effective analgesic. O'Shaughnessy returned to England in 1842 and provided cannabis to pharmacists. Doctors in Europe and the United States soon began to prescribe it for a variety of physical conditions. Cannabis was given to Queen Victoria, quite a court physician, for the treatment of her painful premenstrual cramps. Pharmacies welcomed the arrival of this, quote, new medicine, unquote, cannabis indica, because at that time their shelves held few truly effective drugs to offer the practitioners of allopathic medicine. As its use became increasingly widespread, clinical reports on cannabis accumulated. <clears throat> and by the turn of the century, more than 100 papers had been published in the Western medical liter literature. It was admitted to the United States Pharmacopoeia in 1850, and commercial cannabis preparations soon became widely distributed through drugstores. The decline of the usage of cannabis in the cow began toward the end of the 19th century. Both the potency of cannabis preparations and its absorption from the bowel were too variable, and individual responses to orally ingested cannabis seemed erratic and unpredictable. The fact that cannabis could be smoked was unknown at that time, and so it was delivered as an alcoholic solution. Cannabis products, as already noted, are insoluble in water and so cannot easily be administered by injection. And now physicians could prescribe easy to take pills of known potency for these two problems, pain and insomnia. And this hastened the decline of cannabis as a medicine. But the new drugs had striking disadvantages. Many people die from aspirin induced bleeding each year in the United States. And the barbiturates were, of course, far more dangerous. But the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 was the ultimate death knell for cannabis indica. Under Harry Anslinger, in which the public was led to believe that cannabis, now commonly referred to as marijuana, was addictive, and that its use led to violent behavior, psychosis, and mental deterioration. The Marijuana Tax Act was not directly aimed at the medical use of cannabis, its purpose was to, discu to discourage recreational marijuana use. Almost incidentally, the law made medical use of cannabis difficult. Furthermore, physicians allowed themselves to become ignorant about this drug, as they had since the mid-1930s, increasingly exploded, <laughs> I beg your pardon, been increasingly exposed, along with every other citizen, to the deceptive propaganda against marijuana propagated 
by the United States government and such private organizations as the Partnership for a Drug-Free America. Now, Perry Cassidy, with the explosive growth of the use of marijuana as a recreational drug in the 60s, many users serendipitously rediscovered its useful, usefulness for a variety of medical problems. By the mid-90s, its desirability as a medicine became so great that states, beginning with California in 1996, began to make its use legal for specified medical conditions. It continues to be confined to Schedule I of the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970 as a drug that has a high potential for abuse, lacks accepted medical use. In 1967, I began my studies of the scientific, medical, and other literature with the goal of providing a reasonably objective summary of the data which underlay its prohibition. Much to my surprise, I found no credible evidence. <clears throat> I found no credible medical or scientific basis for the justification of the prohibition, which at that time was responsible for about 300,000 arrests annually. In fact, one of the many exceptional features of this drug is its remarkably limited toxicity. Compared to aspirin, which people are free to purchase and use without the advice or prescription of a physician, cannabis is much safer. There are well over a thousand deaths annually from aspirin in the United States alone. Moreover, it will eventually be hailed as a wonder drug, just as penicillin was in the 1940s. It should come as no surprise that its use as a medicine, legally or illegally, with or without a recommendation from a physician, is now growing exponentially around the world. Marijuana is here to stay. Like alcohol, it has become a part of Western culture, a culture which is now trying to find appropriate legal and medical accommodations for this new kid on the block. In the United States, 23 states and the District of Columbia <clears throat> have established legislation with, which makes it possible for patients suffering from a variety of disorders to use the drug legally with a recommendation for a, from a physician. Unfortunately, because each state arrogates to itself the right to define which symptoms and syndromes, syndromes may be lawfully treated by cannabis, many patients with this, with many patients with the legitimate claims with the therapeutic use of this. this <clears throat> to the therapeutic usefulness plan, must continue to use it illegally and therefore endure the extra layer of anxiety imposed by its illegality. California and Colorado are two states in which the largest number of patients have the freedom to access it legally. New Jersey is the most restricted and I would guess that only a very small fraction of the pool of patients in these states uh, who, would, who would find it to be as or more useful than the invariably toxic conventional drugs that will displace are allowed legal access to it. If this is correct, it is consistent with my view that possible to realize the full potential of this plant as a medicine, not to speak of the other ways in which it is useful, in the, the, set, in the setting of this destructive prohibition. 
But this is rapidly changing as in 2013, both Colorado and Washington repeal, as far as the states are concerned, the prohibition of cannabis for anyone over the age of 21, making it possible for patients of these two states to obtain it without medical consultation. And in 2014, this year, Alaska, Oregon, and the District of Columbia joined them in winning the state of the prohibition. That is the state, not the federal government. Many people are expressing their impatience with the federal government's intransigence as it obdurately maintains its dual archaic positions that, quote, marijuana is harmful, close quote, and that it is not a medicine, in quotes. The states that have made it possible for at least some patients to use cannabis legally as a medicine are inadvertently constructing a large social experiment. Each of these state actions, plus those that have now freed themselves of the prohibition altogether, have taken a slice out of the extraordinary popular delusion, cannabinophobia. There are presently some states which are in the process of enacting medical legislation would respect, which would restrict the legal availability of cannabis to a single cannabinoid, cannabidiol or CBD, a policy which makes little sense Patients who wish to have some degree of psychoactive effect, in fact, often for its antidepressant capacity or because they find the high pleasant, those patients will choose a high THC to low CBD strain. Similarly, those who wish to avoid the psychoactive effects while maximizing the therapeutic capacity will seek strains where that ratio is reversed. These two cannabinoids, along with the terpenoids, behave in what I refer to as an ensemble phenomenon to provide the best therapeutic effect. Despite the U.S. government's three-quarter century long prohibition of marijuana, and its confinement to Schedule I, it is nonetheless one of the most studied therapeutically active substances in history. The keyword search um, PubMed reveals that there are over 20,000 published studies or reviews in the scientific literature referencing the cannabis plants and its cannabinoids. And the and the number is growing almost exponentially. Half of them were published within the past five years. These studies, these studies reveal that marijuana and its active constituents, the cannabinoids and terpenoids, are safe and effective therapeutic and or recreational combat. Unlike alcohol, many prescription or over-the-drug medications, cannabinoids are virtually non-toxic to the health of cells and organs. The official view, at least as far as the federal government is concerned, is that everything possible has to be done to prevent everyone from ever using marijuana, even as a medicine. But there is also an informal law lore of marijuana use that is far more tolerant. Many of the millions of cannabis users around the world not only disobey the drug laws, but feel a principled lack of respect for them. And they have come to doubt that the, quote, authorities, quote, quote, understand much about either the deleterious or the useful properties of the drug. This undercurrent of ambivalent resistance in public attitudes toward marijuana laws leaves room for the possibility of change. 
especially since the costs of prohibition are all so high. Marijuana simply does not conform to the conceptual boundaries established by the 20th century institutions. The only way of the only workable way of realizing the full potential of this remarkable substance, including its full medical potential, is to free it from the present dual set of regulations, those that control prescription drugs in general and the special criminal laws that control psychoactive substances. The only way out is to cut the knot, legalizing it for adults, for all uses, and removing it entirely from the medical and criminal control. It is now clear that we know as much or more about cannabis than we know about many, if not most, prescription pharmaceuticals. Shortly after O'Shaughnessy introduced cannabis as new medicine, Western, medical, Western medicine signaled its acceptance. The government will, sooner or later, abandon its archaic view of cannabis and free it from this costly prohibition, and thereby free the millions of people who are over the age of 21 who want to use it. This will not, however, ensure its rightful place in the pharmacopoeia of allopathic medicine. As modern medicine continues to ignore the use of cannabis as a medicine, this growing practice will surely develop, perhaps into a school of philosophy of medicine, which might be referred to as cannabinopathic medicine. Presently, its only connection to allopathic medicine is the requirement by the states in which cannabis is legally available as a medicine for the patient to first present to the state authorities a document from a physician stating that the patient has a need for cannabis. It seems unlikely that the federal government would at any time in the near future be willing to take an orphan drug, orphan drug law approach to herbal marijuana even after the prohibition has been repealed. The pharmaceutical industry will not undertake such an endeavor because it is impossible to patent marijuana in, in any event. The only difference, albeit an enormous one, will be the continued illegality of whole smoke or ingested cannabis. In any case, Increasing medical use by either distribu distribution pathway will inevitably make a great, great number of people familiar with cannabis and its derivatives. As they learn that its harmfulness has been greatly exaggerated and its usefulness underestimated, the pressure will increase for drastic, for drastic changes in the way we as a society deal with this problem. Thank you.